Welcome to the presentation titled Deep Metrics to Inspire Stronger Performance and Engagement. My name is Tim Mikhailashvili. I'm CEO and co-founder of Amadev Pharma, an analytics and management consulting agency that I had founded years ago. After reflecting on my previous experiences working at various different companies in the industry and realizing that many of our activities and data that we generated were often not reported accurately, consistently, nor in a manner that was relevant to our roles. And so before data science principles became common and started to be introduced into our function, I embarked on a journey to help life science organizations transform data into future behaviors because analysis mediates your edge in action. So in this presentation, I'm going to share some of our approaches and principles to deep metrics and share some real world case studies that you can apply to your organization and partner with us at Amadea Pharma. Let's begin by taking a look at this image, which is intended to grab your attention. It is a symbol of innovation in mobility a self-driving car without a steering wheel that interprets terabytes of data in every given millisecond on weather, traffic conditions, tire traction that helps you avoid an oncoming car from an adjacent lane hitting your vehicle, causing an injury or an accident. Well, that is a perception. However, the reality is that the technology has been here available for quite a few years but it's not always accurate. In fact, I tested it myself on one car manufacturer years ago and recorded it on YouTube. I won't name the manufacturer, but I proved that the lane shift sensor self-driving technology only works two thirds of the time. So you may ask, what does that have to do with medical affairs? Well, it's images such as this that we use to express our activities and contributions in our medical division, which leaves a lot to interpretation because the way this plays out in the real world is that we do not often share all of our valuable insights that have direct business impact with sales, with marketing or our contributions for fear of debate, how they may be perceived or the restrictions that we place on ourselves as we succumb to the notion that perception is reality. Well, reality is more exposed than ever before today as the volume, variety, and velocity of data have increased. So as a result, we run the risk of not expressing the full true value and contributions that we deliver and that we merit as a function. So the journey is challenging. At Amadeur Pharma, we believe that in order to stay competitive and relevant, we have to change how we communicate, design new metrics, new contests, and new incentives, and create learning and development communities. Because our vision is that we, we need to combine sportsmanship with scientific thinking, the two most productive mindsets of employees, regardless of their background, in order to inspire performance and engagement by transforming data into behaviors. And our mission is to help life science organizations accelerate the generation of healthcare continuity, quality, and innovation. But in order to do that in this competitive environment, we need to learn how to design the contests that matter, the metrics that matter, and to ultimately show and grow the value of our teams. What is some of the evidence that I've collected in addition to the observations? Well, in the most recent global webinar attended by many medical affairs leaders, we confirmed that only 5% believe that metrics are meaningful in their organization. 75% believe that they're somewhat meaningful, which indicates a critical gap in the context of metrics. And Addressing that hypothesis, the observation that I had made about separating metrics from culture in our performance evaluation, 
we confirmed that as well, demonstrating that more than half of our colleagues in medical affairs do not place significant weight on culture. They either do not measure behaviors or they place very little value, one to 25% of the in total performance score. So here is the outline for our presentation today in which I'll review the three specific strategies at Amadev Pharma in order to transform data into behaviors. And in order to express our contributions, not just in pictures, but in words and numbers as well. Because pictures tell a story, but numbers tell us how it ends. I'm going to first define deep metrics generally, and then talk about the specific steps in this methodology at the end of the presentation. In short, deep metrics refers to integrating data science analytics with modern organizational change research into medical affairs. And the deep metrics approach is a method that allows us to advance the rationale for why we apply metrics in our functions in the first place and advance the reasoning from just using them to draw attention alone to grabbing a larger share of context and to building a community of colleagues, employees, and competitors who are deeply rooted in sportsmanship and scientific thinking to want to participate in those contests and be evaluated by various different metrics because they are clear about how those metrics and high performance translates into various training opportunities, recognitions, or awards, for example. This presentation is going to be divided into three parts as a result of those three principles of deep metrics. I'm going to speak about attention, context, and community. Well, as we begin to speak about the first most common reason for why we use metrics in the first place, which is to, to draw some attention for our activities, for our time, for our contributions, I'll share with you why I still use my BlackBerry phone. So this is the latest BlackBerry that runs on Android that I use not because I want to grab attention and be different, but because of the context that its use has for me. It decreases the distance from the phone to me with the keyboard that it has, which trains my muscle memory. And believe it or not, there's a community of us it's a smaller community than others, probably in the thousands in the United States, but we recognize each other and we're loyal to this brand. So this is how I evaluate this phone personally. So let's start with attention, which nevertheless is fundamental and it's very important. In order to grab more attention, we need to change how we communicate with each other, right? And so, getting attention is somewhat like receiving likes across social media. You don't really know why you're receiving those likes. It could be because someone just supports you, but not that post or that information, or they may want something in return, um, or they want to grab attention themselves. For example, they see that other people are liking it, right? So you don't really know the meaning of that attention. In the healthcare context, healthcare institutions have to change how they communicate their health records, their patient information data across different in institutions in order to make healthcare more continuous, which is one of the three parts of our mission at Amadev Pharma. So this is how this first strategy maps to our mission, to one, the, to one part of our mission, which is to generate more continuity in healthcare. I spoke about merging organizational change research into deep metrics. Well, there are three classic business management case studies that are relevant in stimulating us to change the norms of our communication in medical affairs as well. And I have listed them here. Bill Gore at WL Gore Associates 
came in to the company and he has only one CEO and no hierarchy and where he pairs up a new hire with a sponsor at the company, a colleague who's incentivized you know, by the success and performance of the new hire that they train or mentor. Paul Pullman came into Unilever and he decreased the numbers of intersections between different departments from 11 to five. So the hierarchy became much smaller, right? So they shared more information more readily and accelerated their performance review process. James Ree came into Ashley Stewart, which was a failing organization that was nearing bankruptcy. And he allowed his employees to promote their local stores using their own personal social media. And they all demonstrate that there is a return on investment you, with through capital by concentrating on the culture of communication. One of the reasons why we don't share our insights is because of the firewall, the restriction that we have between medical and commercial. However, it's quite artificial. Essentially, we are partners in the continuum of healthcare, where we provide the information to physicians about suitable patients for treatments, and our field commercial colleagues educate them on how to secure access to the next generation medications for those patients. So as a result of those restrictions, there's a significant lag time between the generation of those medical insights and capture and communication and actionability. This may translate into unnecessary adverse events, for example. So taking a step back from medical affairs, Boeing accidents a few years ago in the United States, I think illustrate an important example of the significance of this diagram. Because the manufacturing issues that were identified by the frontline employees were largely ignored. And those insights, by the time they got to the management, were no longer a disaster. They became accomplishments. And so the light bulb here that shines brightly becomes very, very small by the time it gets to that actionability in medical affairs. So what if we were to reduce that lag time using different technology, resources, new norms of communication, smartphone apps or Slack, for example, which some pharma companies apparently use in medical affairs. Many of us in medical affairs have different dashboards. I've been a part of different companies that had all kinds of diverse metrics, others that used more informal approaches. From my experience, the companies that really embraced metrics uh, usually tended to be more productive and grow faster and also have stronger performance and recognition among the medical team and across the organization. So I think what matters today is not just the interaction, but the number of discussions per interaction to make those interactions count, to cover as many bases, if you will, per interaction or per at-bat, rather than just have uh, one hit or one attempt or one particular goal. Because the interactions and the meetings or the opportunities to gather those insights uh, are usually very valuable but they are sometimes few and far in between. And this is why a dashboard that I think is most critical today in a medical affairs team is one that expresses a relationship between discussions, interactions, insights, sentiment, and actionable insights. One that also doesn't limit sentiment to positive, neutral, or negative, but also includes the details on the type of sentiment and that maps all of these elements to various filters, categories. For example, real-world evidence, investigational use, or unpublished intelligence, those three categories of insights, for example, or other topics, right, and subtopics. So different layers of uh, filters that anyone in the company, a field employee, or anyone that has access to the dashboard in commercial, in medical, can quickly filter by topic, by insight, by sentiment, 
and also understand whether or not a sentiment includes a superiority claim, for example, or one that states that a physician feels that a particular product or a, a project needs improvement or needs an alternative, for example, or needs urgent action. So these are the kinds of details that should be readily accessible in a dashboard. Mm -hmm. Now, as I mentioned, based on my previous experience, uh, the standard relationship between these elements is depicted here on the left. And the ideal, the target, is one in which there is a larger separation between discussions and interactions, where you actually are reviewing multiple topics or multiple discussions per interaction, but one in which an interaction is much more likely to yield insights, right? You don't have to wait for six interactions to gather one insight, as is usually the case based on my data. Um, and so the insights, sentiment, and actionable insights should be closer or should almost be superimposed in an ideal setting, right? Not all insights, of course, include sentiment or emotions and not all sentiment includes actionable insights as well. So we need to be able to separate these elements in a progressive medical affairs organization. Now, let's start to talk about some case studies. All right. The first case study that I want to share with you is a very memorable one in which a medical affairs team got together, reviewed the literature, and found uh, tremendous gaps in very well accepted uh, publications and reviews, uh, which lumped all kinds of different studies together, did not adjust for differences in endpoints used in one study versus another one. So the medical affairs team here uh, decided to do a new comparative head-to-head -head type of post hoc analysis uh, for this startup, which had a next generation product that only had one adverse event that was competing against the market leader. And so despite the objections, uh, they persisted and uh, published and co-authored a late breaking abstract that essentially received lots of attention from Bloomberg, Seeking Alpha and other kinds of publications that turned around the company after years of frustration. And that directly increased the value of the company, the shareholder value. Not only did it did uh, did changing the way we communicated information uh, lead to that result, uh, but it also changed the messaging of how that medication was now presented across the entire company, not only in medical affairs, where we identified another gap, uh, data regarding the hormone that this product was mimicking. And instead of just positioning the product as uh, a safe safe medication, and one that was most similar to the hormone of which it was an analog, we decided to study whether or not there was a deficiency in this particular patient population of this hormone, which had never been shown in adults before. We confirmed it, turned it around in a few months, and that and, and we we received one time approval from compliance from our leadership to utilize that messaging as a pilot in presentation with health insurance companies, with payers, which ultimately increased the access to next generation medication for many patients. And so we had to change our norms of communication there and go against the grain. And so excited about the impact of this late breaking abstract that we co-authored, we posted it on LinkedIn. However, we were criticized. We were heavily criticized by our leadership for posting it on LinkedIn. And so in the next company where I worked, I influenced some of our leadership to change and update their social media communication policies because our ecosystem and environment is now changing. The FDA doesn't have a clear position on social media off-label discussions. There is a trend over the last few decades that shows that our industry has received very few warning letters from the FDA. Six compared to 195 in 1998. In fact, some of the latest data just recently presented uh, in June at the DIA meeting, 
showed that there's a 78% lower number of DDMAC or Office of Prescription Drug Promotion FDA enforcement letters in 2014 to 2021 versus uh, the decade earlier. So the lesson here for us is not that we need to avoid compliance or regulations, but is that we need to take a clear stand, however updated, in order to make it more consistent with our environment. So our first strategy is changing our norms of communication in order to increase the attention that we receive. Well, how do we then increase the quality of healthcare and also of our performance and engagement? The likes are very important, but it's the comments that provide us with a glimpse of the insights for the motivation for why someone liked that uh, information or why they they attended that poster that late breaking poster right it's the through the comments that we assess meaning and and so in the healthcare setting again it's really through the metrics quality metrics that we now base a lot of our decisions on healthcare institutions and when we grade different healthcare institutions versus others for example or physicians and their quality rankings. And so that brings me to the second and very important strategy of designing metrics that inspire future performance and behavior. When we speak about metrics, usually many of our colleagues in medical affairs cringe because they associate them with competition. Metrics mean more competition. That's one of the first common myths. Another one is that metrics and outcomes are really equal. They're used interchangeably and measured retrospectively, right? Three quarters into the year, you you receive new direction for metrics and you can retroactively go back into your CRM, your database, and then update your metrics. Now, how accurate are they? How much do you really learn from that process? Third most common myth is that metrics are really meaningless. It's really the outcomes that count, right? It's that P&L, right? Profits and losses. Well, In this presentation, I'm going to dispel those myths. And I'm going to argue that it's not that metrics mean more competition, but it's the wrong metrics, unclear or no metrics that lead to more implicit competition. Metrics are not outcomes. Outcomes should be measured retrospectively, but metrics should be implemented prospectively as leading measures. And they need to be different. Metrics and outcomes are going to be different in every different function, and even subspecialty of medical affairs. Finally, if we do not report activities, but only concentrate on outcomes alone, then we will be guessing at best of how to scale and replicate those successes and avoid those repeat failures. So we won't have a process of improvement or growth if we just focus on impact or outcomes. Designing metrics is somewhat like designing a contest or a clinical trial in which we express abstract concepts such as pain, which is very subjective, through a validated visual analog score as an endpoint, for example. The reason for why we have implicit competition in medical affairs is because of that lack of clarity of who the really the judges are, who the audience is, what the, when do we communicate those metrics? What are the tiebreakers? How does one activity differ in its weight versus another one? And how does it translate into an incentive, for example? The reason why I have pictured a high jump competition here is because it is an example of a contest that rewards both performance and sportsmanship equally. One in which no performance enhancing drugs will confer an advantage. And world records have stood for decades. So in those types of situations in which metrics are different from one department to another, or they're unclear in some, there are interdepartmental rivalries that begin to develop. Inaccurate reporting of data or insufficient collaboration between sales and medical, for example, because sales, they know what goals they have, though imperfect, whereas medical affairs employees are told about their metrics, but they don't really know how they correlate to their incentives directly by design. 
And so it's similar to being told to run 100 meters without being told where the finish line is in the case of medical affairs, so, which leads to more competition. So this is why we need to think about the building blocks of our contest metrics. The measurement of metrics is a moving target across the product lifecycle. But regardless, measuring metrics should not be an episode. It should be continuous. And it starts with the metrics management cycle, ensuring data integrity or relevance, or what data scientists call descriptive analytics. Here are some of the working definitions. A metric is an estimate of the relationship between an activity and its desired outcome. Notice that it's an estimate. It can never be perfect or exact. However, qualitative approach is not a metric. And it's not one that you will be able to scale. You will have to somehow express uh, something that's abstract, similar to, let's say, visual analog score to express pain, or notes to express something as abstract as music, for example. Correct? So if we are able to estimate music sounds through notes or pain through visual analog scores, then I believe that we can we need to be able to express engagement behavior, fulfillment in ways that we can scale. An outcome can be defined as any on-demand recurring or routine activity that includes learning and teaching. So an outcome in medical affairs should not just involve interactions, numbers of publications or numbers of attendees, but it's the extent to which we learn and teach information with our internal or external stakeholders that ultimately leads to a change in behavior or strategy. That's how we defined outcome in a pilot at a startup. What we usually include in our metrics are the expectations, the accountability, because that's essentially what metrics symbolize to all of us. However, we, if we're able to directly tie and capture not only metrics, but their relationship to incentives, workflow, and engagement, we may be able to improve the clarity in this language of metrics as well. The metrics that we design influence the workflow and the expectations or the outcomes that we create ourselves. So if our current workflow requires longer time to capture and to plan an activity rather than execute it, then we probably need to change it. And so this is what this hypothetical diagram here shows. Many of us are now working virtually, and I presented a an abstract based on 271 responses from global colleagues across medical affairs working remotely that demonstrated that there may indeed be a virtual productivity threshold, such that those who are engaged in less than three virtual meetings per day may have longer time at their disposal for uninterrupted deep work. So these are the kinds of studies that we need to generate in our medical affairs organizations to understand how can we be more productive. Here are some of the basics that you need to know about analytics and how data science basics can explain how we grade ourselves and our approaches to metrics. Descriptive analytics identify trends. Predictive analytics refer to correlations that we make. And prescriptive analytics indicate causation, defined as variable one is always observed in presence of the other, that it precedes the outcome. For example, the activity precedes the outcome, and that there's no other explanation. Well, here's another way that you can visualize the path as you trace the metrics from activities to outcomes based on our working definition. A level one metric may or may not be relevant, be along the path from activities to outcomes, depending on the function, for example. So if you measure somebody in field medical, medical science liaison, who's expected to be out in the field uh, meeting with physicians by keynote strokes, then that may not be the most relevant uh, or descriptive metric compared to if somebody is expected to be near their computer all day and uh, be uh, on, on at a, at a, at work at a call center or at, in medical information, for example. And so that's why level one metric is denoted by the metrics with an X 
that, that do not fall along that dashed line or that dashed path that you see. A level two metric may be number of attendees at a medical education program or number of publications at a conference, which may be relevant to the activities. Now, level two metric is one that falls along the path or with the, with the dashed lines. However, they have a question mark. So these are the types of metrics that are predictable that may be correlated with activities, such as numbers of publications or attendees at a medical education program. However, without knowing whether or not those publications indeed led to a change in practice or particular changes in behavior, we really cannot ascertain the cause of that publication being leading to that outcome. A level three metrics, however, is depicted by those thumbs up and thumbs down with a check mark that you see in the middle of the graph, where there is a clear path that is traced all the way from activities to outcomes using that metric that validates those patient behaviors or outcomes, for example. And now I'm going to share with you the first application of that deep metrics methodology which I wrote about in an article about four years ago that I called the Medical Productivity Index, which was a combination of some of the best approaches that I had seen uh, that I formed into my own method uh, that led to some of my first consulting work at Amadeo Pharma and that gathered lots of attention from across the industry. What's unique about the MPI is that it weighs performance and behavior equally at 50% each, which is the only formula in which you eliminate the high-performing individuals who undermine others, who are overbearing, uh, and or who, in the sports analogy, sports terms, use performance-enhancing substances, maybe, right? Uh, and so this is an, a, an important effort in order to challenge and to distribute accountability more equally uh, and receive more continuous feedback throughout the year, as well as customize the score and the metric per territory, per ecosystem as well. So let's look at some of the details of the MPI. The performance half of the score includes total MSL points, internal surveys, and external surveys. The first important principle to remember is that the MPI lists all of the activities to be evaluated and ranks them accordingly using numeric values that range from 1 to 10 and that are aligned to medical affairs strategy, ecosystem, or frequency, such that a, an activity that is expected to occur very frequently, such as an interaction, for example, is assigned one point versus in a publication, authoring a publication for MSLs, which happens rarely, would receive 10 points. Qualitative outcomes are also reported. However, they're not expressed numerically. As I mentioned earlier, both the outcomes and the activities have to be measured in order to describe some kind of scientific relationship between them. The internal surveys include feedback from the manager as well as functional and cross-functional collaborators, such as sales, for example. And the external surveys, which previously have been conducted by leadership alone without the knowledge of uh, MSLs, for example, are, are conducted transparently by a third party and also contribute to the performance half of the score. This is what a spreadsheet looked like when we piloted the MPI at a previous company, which consists of formulas. Although it looks complex, it requires input only and just planning ahead of time. Uh, otherwise, afterwards, it becomes somewhat of a template. The outcomes were, were measured in this pilot in a separate spreadsheet. They significantly decreased the time we spent on performance evaluation reviews. Those dreaded performance reviews, which usually take months, they're usually one-sided, they're very subjective, they include a lot of open-ended text, and this is why when we had those performance reviews, we were able to simply filter all our outcomes in that quarter. We kept them monthly, these outcomes, but we were quickly able to recall them, reference them, and send them to our management. 
So it's very important to remember that the surveys are not open-ended. Yes, they're subjective, feedback and perceptions, but they're perceptions from not only our manager, but from external customers, as well as from our internal cross-functional colleagues. And they assess our expertise, the perception of our expertise on the product, on territory, on the disease state, for example, as well as those unique contributions that we make or the our ability to identify gaps. They're scored, they're evaluated by uh, a scale of one to five for a maximum of 50 points. But remember that the more surveys you capture over the course of the year, the more accurate data becomes over time. External performance surveys in the NPI are shorter, uh, sensitive to the time limitation of our customers. However, the questions are phrased in ways that extract some of the most critical attributes of performance from medical affairs. The clarity, the timeliness of the information that's provided to them, uh, and their perception of whether or not that MA employee is an expert. The behavior scoreboard contributes 50% of the total score, and it only includes two components, the external surveys and internal surveys. So the only difference really are the nature of the questions, the wording of the questions, where the behavior scores here evaluate the likelihood that uh, the employee is believed to defend their colleague, regardless of the consensus, apologize, change their mind, sign up for a project, regardless of the exposure of their individual or their individual visibility, for example. And those kinds of very important life skills and or their uh, likelihood to learn a new skill on their own, for example, that's not assigned to them. The external behavior surveys are also in-depth questions that illustrate a, a picture of that medical affairs employee and their level of respect for that KOL as an individual, as well as a healthcare professional that they need to see, that they're required to see, for example, or their level of comfort in sharing true unbiased information in the presence of that MSL, for example, right? So these are also scored in their five questions. So ultimately, the the value of this type of approach, more continuous and data-driven approach to collecting feedback is that we're able to communicate information on both performance and behavior to teams and to individuals and allow them to react accordingly in a timely manner, such that someone who is the highest performer on the team who scores 48, for example, on the performance scores, but is has the lowest behavior score of 40, they end up ranking second on the team, not first, which ultimately leads them to change their behaviors in such a way that they're perceived differently by their teammates as well as by their customers, for example. So that's the ultimate real-world value of an MPI case study. When I speak about MPI and deep metrics, I'm asked about, well, what other functions could it be applicable in? Well, let's now look at medical education or external education. Medical education is now being delivered in many different ways. If we look at medical education delivered via social media, there are about 600 studies in the systematic review that report metrics from social media delivered medical education programs. However, what we find is that most of the metrics that are published from these programs only tell us what we already know, which is that social media is an acceptable method of delivering medical education and that there is knowledge acquisition that takes place in the process. However, only two to 3% communicate any behavioral changes or organizational or patient outcomes as a result of those programs. And this is why the new return on education in social media has to be reimagined, revisited. Typically, when physicians, healthcare professionals attend our medical education programs, whether in person or virtually, they receive a survey after which months may go by, weeks or months may go by, and uh, we learn about their intent to change behavior. However, the intent to change behavior is only a commitment, a, a written commitment from our attendees. 
And it's an episode. It's a cross section in that moment of their belief at that time. So we need to start to validate whether or not that behavior indeed has changed, right? And we need to be able to also confirm knowledge retention over time, not just knowledge acquisition that same day, that week, right? So communicating these metrics also has to be done transparently. Diversify the kinds of metrics not as only the numbers of attendees or number of views, for example, on Twitter or on YouTube of our programs, right? Which may be defined as three seconds. So is three seconds enough to really acquire and retain knowledge? And this is why the deep metrics approach makes a distinction that education, like metrics, is not an episode, it needs to be continuous. And so it needs to be tested continuously and also be diverse. Has to include various different types and formats of surveys as well over time. That brings me to a third case study that I want to share with you. Let's take surgeons as an example who attend your medical education program. And they demonstrate that they have full intent to change their behavior. Well, you probably should intervene maybe weeks or months down the road with those who attended your program. And before the beginning of the cases, their clinical cases that day or that week, you distribute a survey in which you ask about the patients they expect to see, their conditions, their resources, references they're going to use, and whether or not they recall your program that they attended. And you provide them with a link to it as well that they can review. Now, that third point is very important because that allows them a chance, an opportunity to apply the learning and the education from your program in order to inspire changing the behavior and actually applying that behavior and improving the quality of care. After the end of the cases, that at the end of the day or at the end of the week, after the point of care, you then distribute another survey to those attendees or to a select number of those attendees or surgeons, for example, in this case. And you ask, you collect more information about their decisions that they had made that day for better recall, for example, the references they used, whether or not this educational program, the reference educational program that you organized impacted their decision. And if so, how, right? So this is an example of an approach that utilizes that deep metrics approach and that demonstrates not only relevance, not only predictability, predictive analytics, but prescriptive analytics or causation, causality, right, directly. And it requires you to generate evidence, a case study, could be one case study in order to prove to your management and others to do more of such programs in the future. And the next case study I'll talk about is publications. The impact factor is a well-known metric that we're all familiar with, uh, in which we have a benchmark of citations, of number of citations in the past two years or three years. Uh, However, the impact factor does not adjust for types of articles, uh, types of citations. Remember that different fields in medicine have their own individual respective approaches to citations or their standards of citations, right? They may be less or more likely to cite their colleagues in some fields. So the goal of the publication clinical impact score that I've designed based on my deep metrics approach is to help indicate the relative probability that this particular publication will be integrated into clinical practice, right? Along that spectrum from basic science to real world evidence. And so identifying the gaps of the impact factor and and a range of other scores, I eliminated the author's impact on the score altogether. So this is not an H index that sometimes is used in order to communicate the relative expertise of an author or their influence in their field. So I narrowed down the variables to a bare minimum, to objective scientific approach that is limited to 
the merits of the article, the article type, which are weighed accordingly. So they're weight adjusted. The subjects that are studied, humans, animals, in vitro, the numbers of citations, and not only the numbers of citations, but the types of citations, what types of articles that are also weight adjusted, as well as the recency. So these five variables can also be further broken down into three different subscores of the translational index, reach, and recency as well. And each of them are divided by a particular factor. So ultimately, the score uh, can be interpreted uh, to demonstrate how likely is one publication to be suitable for researchers or for drug discovery versus others who may be implementing them into their guidelines, for example. So a low score doesn't mean that a publication is not valuable. So I provided various different examples and case studies from medical education, from field medical and, and publications. And these are different departments within different, different units within medical affairs, all of which contribute significantly to the success of the organization as a whole. I think it's very important to demonstrate the relative contribution of one versus the other to its medical affairs strategy, as well as the organizational goals. So here's one way that you can compare productivity across different functions. Divide the goals into three categories. One, corporate objectives or corporate goals. Two, a cross-functional outcome goal or outcome score. And third, an individual function score. So that could be publications, for example, right? Publications may have their own goals that map to the medical affairs strategy or to the uh, or organizational corporate goal as well for example, right? And so the corporate objective score is weight adjusted and uh, has the highest factor, 0.2 in this case, whereas the cross-functional outcome and individual functional outcome score have a lower factor or weight. Uh, so you can customize the factors, of course, but they essentially express both activities and outcomes numerically and they are multiplied by a factor and ultimately added up, right? And they're added up to demonstrate a particular weight-adjusted uh, organizational productivity score, which can be used, can be simplified in such a manner by emphasizing these three categories, medical affairs corporate score, the cross-functional goal, and the individual functional goal as well. Gaining more attention with updated communication methods and channels, grabbing a larger share of context and more quality through better metrics are important, but they do not necessarily lead to innovation until we start to scale, scale those messages and that quality. Right? And we do that by building a community. An argu argument at Amadev Farm is that you can build a community by highlighting and emphasizing metrics. We begin to innovate once we share not only words and dialogue or information, but we share emotions. And all of that begins with a learning and development community that we brand and that we continuously revisit because in that social media analogy that I used earlier, the likes are great. So are the comments. However, it's once other people start to share and reshare your information, your posts, your content, that you're able to scale and innovate. And that's how building a community of sports-minded scientific thinkers, regardless of their backgrounds or scientific or sports backgrounds or functions, is going to lead to innovation in healthcare. In, in our opinion. And so this is how a learning and development community maps and, and ties with our mission of helping generate more healthcare innovation. Here is my personal learning and development platform that I've built over the years through my transformation. An integral part of Amadev Pharma's 
value proposition is its multicultural leadership platform and organizational change podcast called All Out Coach, in which I've interviewed Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 business executives, independent thinkers, best-selling authors, and executives in pharma and beyond, where my goal is to help people transcend their differences and extend the boundaries of their roles and responsibilities, stretch themselves and lift others. So it's a continuous learning and development platform that I'm very proud of, and also that has a YouTube channel, All Out Coach YouTube channel as well. An in-weekend newsletter that is published on LinkedIn, full of case studies in business management, clinical development, and medical affairs, and from pharma, digital health, the Amadea Pharma blog, which contains many different summaries of webinars, blogs, uh, podcast interviews, and other uh, case studies and evidence that, that are unique. And then, of course, the serving as a volunteer, as a chair of the Medical Affairs Global Mentorship Program at the Medical Affairs Professional Society, which is a premier global medical affairs organization that numbers over 9,000 members. So all of these five elements collectively make up the services and the continuous education and learning and development approach at Amadev Farm. Previously serving as a trainer of the eastern half of the country for a large team, we have many different resources available, many technical resources as well as life skill resources that not all of us were using. So during field coaching, during field visits with customers, and between them, I created opportunities in which we discussed and applied those videos in the LMS, learning and management system that we had at our company. So some of the qualities of the best learning management systems are that it has to be simple to access. It has to be part of a continuous conversation and ultimately lead to a community in which we integrate some of those different skills and, uh, and business acumen into medical affairs as well. And we cross over those boundaries. Education comes in different formats. It's very personalized. And this is some evidence that uh, shows that we have to test after we educate. And different types of formats of testing, such as multiple choice, versus a hands-on training or learning uh, may have different outcomes as well in terms of validity or reliability causing those uh, changes in behavior. Ian Lang in 1991 said it best that teaching without testing is like cooking without tasting or writing without reading. Right? We all, we learn in bite-sized pieces of information, however, regardless of how we learn, we need to continue to reinforce that learning and also do it in groups as well or with others as well to practice. So one of the best, most, most effective ways to learn and to teach is to involve, right? And you can involve by not just practicing what you preach, but you end up practicing what you play through those shared experiences, through the competitions that you create in that community, in that learning community, for example. And it makes it much more likely to not just tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Where I would change that Benjamin Franklin quote and I would update it to tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, play together and we learn. The gamification is one in which Amadev Pharma is taking a lead. We created a first ever medical affairs innovation Olympics this September. That's a month long, multi stage, asynchronous online event that culminates in a series of live stream debates across different companies in our industry. When we speak about learning and development, we have to embrace training. So, just like compliance, code of conduct training that all of us are required to complete, there's a strong case for us to make designing metrics and performance metrics an important science and a, a, an important training competency. And therefore, I've created a 29-page 
Medical Affairs Metrics Workbook, which is essentially a communications playbook, if you will, that allows you to interact and also complete the workbook yourself and customize it to your function, to your organization. It includes a metric score, which includes 10 questions based on which you can assess how relevant is your score, is your metric, based on the, the characteristics that you have on the left. And as promised, here's the summary of eight steps of the deep metric cycle that you can use to customize to any function across medical affairs and beyond. First, list out all the activities that you want to evaluate or all the endpoints, all the employees. Rank them. Rank them numerically. Right. Secondly, define outcomes. Distinguish them from activities by function. For example, publication may be an outcome. So, for example, publication may be an outcome for field medical, but it may be an activity for the publications department. Generate case studies to trace outcomes to activities, similar to that, that, that surgical case study I discussed. Number four, classify metrics based on your three levels of control, correlation or causation, or in other words, data integrity, data predictability, data translation. That's how you want to be able to report how confident you are that those activities must have led to that those outcomes. When you report to your executive management. You're going to have confidence levels of your metrics that you will be reporting as well. Collect more information more continuously from internal and external feedback. So this is a way for you to collect more balanced information from everyone who is directly impacted by those same evaluations that you're trying to measure. No open-ended text. Keep it data-centric, data science. Convert that text with those smart questions that are customized, that are specific, Two numbers, all right? Number six, train, gamify, and apply metrics and playbooks. So this is the L&D part of the deep metrics, right? You have to be able to have training and demonstrate that you're improving and you're designing metrics that matter, the contests that matter. Number seven, study the relationship between metrics and workflow, incentives, and engagement. So this is an important point here where you're going to, start to analyze the data. So you first generate the case studies, right? You do the training, but then you have to analyze in order to draw that relationship between the retrospective outcomes that you've now collected and the prospective activities. The last very important part of the cycle, and remember, this is again a cycle. This is the last part of the cycle. It's that you modify the medical affairs strategy. All the evidence that you generate ultimately helps you inform and transform medical affairs strategy. Change strategy accordingly to these new metrics, new studies, new relationships between the workflow, the engagement, the incentives, the awards that you provide to your employees. And then you start over. Then the cycle starts over again. So very importantly, you apply the deep metrics cycle. Now, what do you stand to benefit? Well, these are the three outcomes that you can expect, the three results from such an approach. First, you'll distribute accountability more evenly, which will increase engagement. When people know that they are being reviewed by not only their peers, but up, down, and across the organization and externally as well, they're probably going to step up their game and increase their engagement. Second, you'll increase the accuracy in predicting and inspiring future individual and team behaviors. This is where medical affairs can take the lead in improving the forecasting of not only their organization and their function, but across the organization as well, on the corporate level. If we're involved earlier in medical affairs and we use such a scientific approach to deep metrics, that we can improve our strategy, ultimately. Our strategy of medical affairs, of our function, of our specialty, subspecialty, as well as that of the entire company as well. And then third, we'll have more continuous, more real-time and global feedback 
that will drive performance, that will be less biased. We'll have feedback that will drive not only engagement, but performance, stimulate higher performance as a result of the feedback throughout the year, not at the end of the year, right? not even in, in six months. Because of that continuous approach, we can change our metrics or we can change our designs earlier on. We don't have to wait. You know, we'll, we don't have to wait for three months in the beginning of the year to come up with a strategy. We'll be able to, to make changes to our strategy more, more often. It'll be more compact because usually the metrics are not rolled out to a team until about March or April. By the time that comes, there's already a whole quarter has passed and you don't even have any accountability or any metrics. So those are the three results. Increasing engagement, improving strategy, and driving performance as a result of the deep metrics approach. And I'll close with one of my favorite moments from the Tokyo Olympics in 2020, which you will probably remember. This was the high jump competition, a final in which both Mutaz Barshim from Qatar and Gianmarco Tamberi of Italy had cleared the top height. And the judge had approached them and asked them whether or not they wanted to participate in a tiebreaker to determine the winner. At which point, Mutaz Barshim then turned to Gianmarco Tamberi. And without an exchange of words, in literally one second, he then turned back to the judge and he asked, can we share two goals? And at that point, as a fan of competition and Olympics, I was frustrated. I was disappointed because we didn't have a clear winner of a gold medal in a very highly contested event. However, it wasn't until I read that they were friends and that they had trained together, had endured serious injuries before major competitions and that they had decided to share a sportsmanship message to the next generation of athletes that I realized that a different outcome could not have been possible in this case. Had it not been for that culture of communication that they had created between the two of them. And so by emphasizing metrics, and changing the norms of our behavior and finding a community to which we belong, we can transform competition into collaboration for next generation of professionals in medical affairs. So remember, NMDF Pharma will help you analyze yourself, your team, your competition by combining sportsmanship with scientific thinking in order to transform data into future behaviors rather than report past activities alone because metrics play an integral role in shaping our behaviors and our culture. The culture directly impacts performance and it has to be quantified. And so we combine both performance and behavior that will help you and your teams show and grow your the value of your teams by using not only pictures, but words and numbers that people can touch and feel. So contact me, Tim Michalashvili, at timmick at amadeafarma.com. I look forward to your organization joining me in our journey together to improving healthcare continuity, quality, and innovation.